So my title says right, that we're going to talk about leveling up your application security program. What I'm actually going to do is talk about how we've leveled things up at Riot Games, and hopefully you're able to take some of those things away and level up your own application security programs. So I wanted to quickly introduce uh, myself and Riot Games, uh, for those of you who don't know who I am and who Riot are. And then I kind of want to talk about three different areas. Right? I want to talk about Riot application security as a whole, how we approach AppSec, how we build relationships with software engineers, and how we ship uh, secure products to tens of millions of uh, games players around the world. And then I want to talk about bug bounty um, and automation. So the part that those two things have played in leveling up um, our application security programs. So for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm David. I'm a senior security engineer at Riot Games. Uh, I lead our global application security and bug bounty programs. Um, I've been doing AppSec full time for about 10 years now. Most of uh, those 10 years were actually spent in financial services. For the past two and a half years, I've been uh, building and developing the AppSec program uh, at Riot. Probably won't surprise people when I say that doing that in the computer games industry is more fun than doing it in finance world, at least for me anyway. And then like everyone else at Riot, I play a lot of games. I'm sadly not very good at many games, certainly not the game that we develop and publish. So as a company, uh, Riot are the developers and the publisher of a game called League of Legends, which is one of the most played computer games in the world. Um, 60, 70 million people around the world play uh, the game uh, every single month. But as a company, we try and make sure that we always focus on the player. Um, so the player experience, what it means to a player when we do or don't do things. And so from an AppSec point of view, that what that means is we, can, we think about AppSec a little differently, whether it's how we put a risk score on a vulnerability, whether we implement certain security controls or not. We don't think of it in terms of compliance or money or any of those kind of things, although they are obviously still things we need to consider. We consider it in the context of what it means to a player. So for cross-site scripting vulnerabilities on a website, we don't just immediately say, oh, that's a medium risk. Right? We, we look at the context and we look at how players may or may not use that website. Um, so one of the things that we also do that's quite different at Riot is this thing called eSports. And so League of Legends is the biggest eSports in the world. And so the picture you see on the screen there is from our World Championship final last year where there were 15,000 people in an arena in Berlin to watch two teams, the two best teams in the world play against each other. On top of that, 36 million people watched this final live online. So it's a pretty big sporting event when this happens. What does that got to do with AppSec? Well, our biggest product, our code, is being watched by 36 million people who know the game inside out. There's a lot of money and pride and a lot of the things on the line for teams who win or lose the world final. Now, what if a team was able to find a bug that they could exploit in a way that triggered a remake of a game that maybe changed the result of the final completely. So we have not just the traditional AppSec vulnerabilities to look out for, we have a part to play in upholding the integrity of a multi-million dollar sports event. Um, so slightly different than maybe some of the things people have to consider. So now I want to talk about Riot AppSec and how we approach it at Riot, how we work with individual product teams, software engineers, and so on. So this is our mission statement as an AppSec team at Riot. We aim to arm every software engineer with the tools and knowledge they need to build safe and secure experiences for players and rioters. So what does that really mean? Well, it means that when anyone is writing code in Riot, whether it's written internally, whether they've outsourced it, whether it's a product just for players in Russia or products that go to every single player of ours around the world, we are there as a support function for them. We are there to make sure that they have everything they need from us to continue working in a fast, agile manner and shipping cool things out to players. Because we want that. We're also gamers. Everyone at Riot is a gamer. We want these cool features to be out there and we want to make sure that those product teams have what they need to do that in a secure way. So one of our main focuses is about supporting software engineers. And so this guy on the screen here is a support champion. It's a specific role that someone will play in our game. Their job is really to find people who need help, right, and to build them up, support them until they're able to go off 
and be very powerful and strong by themselves. And so this actually makes it very easy for us to connect to our, our software engineers and product teams because we can tell them that we want to be their support champion. We want to go and find people who need help from a security point of view, give them what they need so that they can go off and be successful without us. And then we move on to the next team who needs a security support champion. Right, so we have people writing code all around the world, and we don't have AppSec people all around the world. So this isn't just about you know, physically putting an AppSec person into a team. Right? This is more than that. We also find that teams want different things. People from different cultures want different things in different ways from us. Right? So this isn't us going along and saying, hey, we're a support champion, but we can only do it this way. Again, just like in the game, there are many different types of support champions, and the, how they act depends massively on which one you pick. So, like, we, we ultimately don't want to be like these two teams on the screen here, right? We don't want to be fighting against or with software engineers and product teams, right? If you're a security person and that's what you do, then it might upset you, but you're doing it wrong, right? You need to fight alongside with them to help you and them be successful, right? If you're just there to stop them, to slow them down, to tell them that they're making mistakes, you're, you will not achieve your own goals, let alone what the company wants to achieve. Because ultimately at Riot, our AppSec team want to ship product suppliers that don't have vulnerabilities in them. Our software engineers and product teams want to ship things that are fun and enjoyable for players, but they also want them to be safe and secure. So to fight with those teams and slow them down and block them and make them unhappy with AppSec actually makes no sense at all. The only way that we can both achieve the things we want to achieve is by working closely together. So one of the most important things there for us is actually going and meeting software engineering teams, like learning what they actually need from us. Rather than coming along as a security team and saying, this is what we're giving you, this is what you've got to use, we go and speak to those teams and learn what they need from us. So our AppSec roadmap, certainly in my two and a half years at Riot, has largely been driven by what software engineers and product teams have told us they need from us to build secure experiences for players. You know, we have many, many millions of lines of code around the world. And we have between 15 and 20 different programming languages being used because we have pretty much every product type you could think of, from a, a game client that goes to tens of millions of computers around the world, a game server, mobile apps, uh, APIs for players to use, websites, and they're all written in many different languages. We, as an AppSec team, can only achieve our goals by working with the product teams and giving them what they need. So a lot of that is about reaching out to these product teams, right? And so one of the ways we can, we can figure out what we think they need from us is data, right? So, you know, we have a centralized vulnerability project in JIRA at Riot. Every single security vulnerability Riot-wide goes into this project. So it doesn't matter whether it's like an AWS misconfiguration or it's a SQL injection vulnerability or, you know, remote code execution via the game client. It doesn't matter. They all go there. And so we do a lot of tagging of those vulnerabilities as they go in there, like by product type, by vulnerability type, and a few other different things, right? But what that allows us to do over time is really identify the problems that our engineers and product teams are having. Right? This isn't us taking the OS top 10 and assuming that that is what our engineers have problems with. We can essentially create our own top 10, right? Because we have our vulnerability data and we can then start to give them things that they need from us. So I'm going to come back to the, the data side of things a little bit later on and how that influenced some of our decisions. But I think probably the, the low-tech solution here is probably the most important one, and also maybe not the one that we as an industry are great at doing. You know, go and speak to people. When I visit a lot of the different Riot offices, most of my time is spent in meetings with software engineers and product owners, and I know that might sound boring, but it's not. I get to meet and spend time with the people who are building these amazing things and scaling them up to tens of millions of people. I get to learn a ton when I go and meet those people. But the point of meeting them is, again, to figure out what they need from us. It's not us going there and saying, hey, we're doing this for you. We find out what they need from us. And so there's one question that I always ask them when I go and meet them. And that is, when you're sat there doing your job every day, what is it that you wish you had from us? And answers to that question over the past couple of years has significantly changed the roadmap for AppSec. Right, there are things later on in this talk that I'm going to talk to you about automation in particular that we've developed 
um, that directly came from the answer to that question from a software engineer in Los Angeles. Um, so reach out to people, actually go and talk to them and figure out what they need from you. And so one of the things that I guess you can't get away from is sharing application security knowledge. And, and I suppose my thoughts on training software engineers could probably take up a whole talk by itself. Um, but you know, in the whole of my time in AppSec, I've never come across a developer who wanted to ship code that had vulnerabilities in it. I have come across a lot of developers who didn't get what they needed from application security people to ship code that doesn't have vulnerabilities in it. So when I joined Riot, I, I suppose I took the approach that most people would do, right? Training classes, get developers into a classroom. Unsurprisingly, um, that didn't work at a games company. Our engineers wanted to learn about it. They didn't want to sit down for two or three days in a classroom being taught about the OS top 10, right? So actually, the thing you see on the screen now is not just an image. This is uh, a card that we created, right? So this little card that we shipped to engineers all around the world. Now, it's not supposed to be comprehensive in terms of, it's not supposed to cover every single security thing that we care about. What it's there for is a little reminder on their desks, of things that they should think about. And so we actually borrowed an idea that was already implemented within Riot Engineering. When I first visited, visited, sorry, when I first visited our head office in LA, I noticed that a lot of our developers actually had a card on their desk called the definition of done card. This was a simple, small little card, a little bit smaller than the one I just showed you. And really, that was there for engineers to, be, uh, I guess, be reminded of what good looked like before they checked their code in, right? Real simple things. And so we decided to piggyback on that idea, right? They already had this concept ingrained of having this card on their desk and checking it. So we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We just essentially copied it and made it look a bit nicer. And so, like I said, those are not supposed to be you know, that's not a comprehensive checklist. That's not everything we care about, but it's the things to us that are probably most important based on our vulnerability data and security issues we've had in the past. Now, I think probably the most important bit is two URLs at the bottom. So for, unfortunately, they're both just still internal resources for now, but we are uh, looking after a conversation earlier this morning to maybe open source those things. Um, these pages are supposed to back up the card. So if an engineer looks at this, and they don't know the answers to those points. They go to these websites. So the first one is AppSec Design. You can think of this as a checklist that replaces conversations we as security people will probably have when someone sits down to design a product. Right? And these, these are very small, kind of concise checklists. A little bit like uh, if anyone's read the checklist manifesto, the concept of like pilot checklist, right? Real so simple, four different product types. The questions are written in such a way that if it's yes, or not applicable, they don't need to reach out to security. If they answer no to any of those questions, that means there was a security control that was applicable and they haven't planned to implement it. That's a sign you should probably reach out to the AppSec team. If they go to securecoding.riotgames.com, what they are greeted with is a page for every one of the programming languages we use at Riot. When they drill into the relevant page, so JavaScript, for example, they will see all of the points here, plus or minus uh, extra ones, depends on the language and what's important. And then what they'll see is not a big waffly page of security stuff, right? They will just see what they need. A very brief description of each one of the points, and then a code sample of how we would recommend they tackle this problem in their code in that language. You know, sometimes we even, you know, we'll recommend libraries to use. We've also expanded this out to cover common frameworks as well. So for example, if you go to the JavaScript page, you'll get generic JavaScript guidance, but then we also cover things like Node and the specific things an engineer would need to do, know around that. So ultimately, our job is to make sure that we are enabling engineers to be successful, right? that we're not slowing them down, we're not asking them to change the way they work, we're not forcing tools on them which they don't like, that are not effective for them, and we can't come in with this kind of heavy compliance mandated security requirements, PCI says this type approach, right? I've worked in finance, I know that that does work and probably is valid as an approach in some organizations, but in Riot, that's totally not gonna work. If we tried to do that, we would be ignored, right? Or if we go along and try that, we'd be, become a blocker for teams who want to ship awesome things to our players. Now, if we become a blocker, they will ignore us. And they won't embrace us and they won't work with us, which ultimately means no one is happy, right? Because we don't ship secure products if we don't work together. 
So because we've taken this approach of you know, being that support champion to product teams, giving them what they need from us based on what they tell us they need, you know, we have teams queuing up to work with us now because they see that we're not that AppSec team that they have nightmares about or they've heard stories about from other companies where they're a blocker, they're that kind of police central audit, they're gonna say no to everything and slow you down type team, right? Because we don't have that, in fact, it just creates another problem because now I don't have enough AppSec resources to actually deal with the amount of teams coming to us, which is actually a fantastic problem to have, but it's one we still have to solve. So when teams come to us, we don't try and force like a one size fits all solution onto them, right? It's not like we come along and say, hey, you should follow the Microsoft SDL, or you've got to do threat modeling and security review, pen tests, and so on for every single thing you release. I don't like that approach, and it wouldn't work for our engineering teams. Our engineering teams have a ton of freedom to decide what they work with in terms of technologies and how they work. So we can't go along with this kind of one-size-fits-all solution, because sometimes we don't know what a product team is doing or how they are working until they come and engage with us. So what we do is we learn about what they're doing. We learn about what is important to them. We learn about their prior security knowledge or security vulnerabilities we may have seen in their products or their type of product in the past. And you know, this can vary wildly, right? It can be a simple website right way up to you know, a brand new game, right, at a games company. There's a, there's a massive difference between what a team needs from you in that point, from that point of view, right? So we just make sure that they understand everything we can offer to them almost like a menu, right, with a cost associated with it. If you take all of these things, here's the benefit to you, but here's the kind of average cost to you from a development point of view, of how many days it might add to a development. Because at Riot, those product teams actually own the security of their own products, not us. So our job is to make sure that they fully understand the risks for their product type, fully understand the things that we can do to help them uh, you know, reduce the risks associated with that product, and then they choose what they take from us. Now, what I've found is because we have that very open approach with them, you know, they, they're not that kind of skeptical team of like, oh, is AppSec just trying to force all of these things on me? We don't have that. In fact, what I actually see is product teams tend to take more security services from us because they see that we're trying to help them. Sometimes they even try and take too much and we have to explain to them where things don't really add value for them and their product type. But that again is, is a really good problem to have. So one of the other things um, that we've been able to build up because we do that kind of outreach is this idea and this concept of security champions. Right? And this is not a new concept and I know there are a couple of talks happening um, during the conference around this kind of thing. But what we found is when you start reaching out uh, to product teams and they start to try and work with you, it always tends to be maybe the same one or two people, right? They're either the person that the team has nominated as the security champion, or they're the ones that are passionate about security and always put their hand up to be the ones that want to work with AppSec. When you identify those kind of people, uh, be very happy about it and then figure out how you can level them up, how you can make them an even better security champion. And so we've, we've seen those kind of security champions turn into support champions and go off and help other product teams level up the security of their products without even needing us, which is fantastic. So what we do when we identify those people is we give them more of everything. So you know, when I go to LA, they get more of my time than other software engineers would. They get more of our team's time. They get more resources. They get access to everything we do before anyone else. Granted, that means they're sometimes a little bit of a guinea pig for us, but those teams are so interested and passionate about champion, uh, sorry, about security, and they have this champion within their team that they're happy to do that. So the card I showed before, those security champions were the ones that helped us you know, really refine our design and the content of the card. Some of the automation I'm going to talk about earlier, so, uh, sorry, later, security champions helped us decide what we should build, and then they were the first ones to get access to those tools. What we've also done on top of that uh, this year is actually pay for some of those security champions to go to application security conferences. So we're kind of lucky that AppSec California, which is an OWASP conference, is like 10 minutes away from our head office in Los Angeles. So what we did in January this year for that is we just bought a bunch of extra tickets and gave them out to security champions and said, look, why don't you come along to this security conference with the security team, um, and then they go away and they've learned more and then they need us a little bit less going forward, right? That's not a big expense to do something like that. 
So I wanted to touch, you know, relatively briefly on the Riot Bug Bounty program and the part that it has played in leveling up our AppSec. Um, I recently recorded an hour-long talk on our Bug Bounty program that will be published soon. So this really is quite a, a high-level overview into it and why it's important to us. So one of the things I need, wanted to do first was kind of step back in time and talk about why we actually created the Bug Bounty program in the first place. Because you might think now, sat here in 2016, it might be obvious why we created the Bug Bounty program. But we never created a program initially because we wanted to find things like XSS or SQL injection. We were a games company. You know, our needs back then and still are a little bit different. So to start off with, we started thinking about this in 2012 for two different reasons. Firstly, we were hacked and we lost a lot of player data here in Europe. And when we investigated that breach, we found that someone had been able to find a vulnerability and a way to get remote access to one of our servers. Instead of telling us about it, they sold it on a hacking forum, which then allowed someone to break in and steal all this data. Now, if we had had a bug bounty program, that doesn't necessarily mean that they would have come and told us about that issue, but it did make us start uh, thinking very hard about how can we create a way for people to report issues to us. Now, we're also a games company. As our games started to grow in popularity, can anyone guess what, what a, one of our other motivators was back then? No? <laughs> no. Cheaters. Everyone who's played a game has cheated at some point, whether people want to admit it or not, right? And I think if you're cheating in like a solo sandboxed environment, well, it can actually create a significantly different, maybe better experience for you as a player. But when you take that into a game with other people who aren't cheating, you're not playing on the same field as anyone in, anymore, and you spoil the experience of those players. So we actually wanted initially to create an avenue for people who found ways to create cheat tools for League of Legends to report them to us, right? This wasn't about SQL injection and all those kind of things, right? As we grew, we tried to work on like a contractor model with some of those people. Uh, once we got to about three of them, for a lot of different reasons, that was not gonna scale. So then uh, we went with HackerOne, right? We launched a HackerOne program back in 2014 and we went public with that uh, right at the end of 2014. And last year and this year was really about taking that program forward and trying to make it uh, one of the best programs in the world for researchers. So, you know, Riot as a company talks about being, you know, player first. We want to be researcher first, right? We want to be a program that every researcher is super happy to be part of and tells other researchers they should try and join. So these two short kind of clips kind of sum it up for me. We, we kind of ended up being like Leona and Ari here, charging along, doing our day job, and then out of nowhere, we get hit with a big ax, right? No one likes that. Your data's ended up on Pastebin or on Reddit, and you're then left scrambling, trying to protect your company, your players, your customers, and then, well, you do end up getting hit again by a big ax. And no one really wants that, right? That's not a fun experience for anyone, whether it's in a game or in real life, you don't want that to happen to you, right? So we didn't want to be caught out by these security vulnerabilities being exploited like we had in 2012, right? We wanted to know about these things before they became a problem. And so by having a bug bounty program, these researchers are able to come along um, you know, and shine a light on security problems before they become a big problem for us, right? We have then a chance to react to these things. We have a chance to fix the security vulnerabilities and fight on a more level footing, right? Get rid of these vulnerabilities before they're exploited. And so ultimately, I guess what I'm saying is with Bug Bounty, you want to be less like Leona getting hit by a big ax and more like big, scary, angry cat dude here uh, when it comes to security vulnerabilities. So we, we still have some distance to go. We still have some way to go before we consider ourselves one of the best programs around. So those things that you see on the screen there are the different ranks in League of Legends. And the one with the blue arrow underneath it, basically almost no player gets to that level. When you get to that level, you either make a ton of money streaming on Twitch or you play for one of those pro teams, probably. So we, being very hard on ourselves, would say we're about here at the moment. Um, and this will possibly be my, probably Alex down here's favorite slide in my talk because this is from HackerOne. Because what I wanted to bring this back to is how has the Bug Bounty program enabled us to have a better application security program? So we're not quite where we want to be yet. There are points on that chart there, like the response efficiency, for example, where I want it to be a lot better. But you can see in our best areas, we're significantly better than the average enterprise, right? And reward competitiveness. But the one that really uh, jumps out to me as being something that I like is vulnerability is fixed. That's where we start to look at how this really levels up our application security program, because we fix around about 
of the security issues reported to us via our bug bounty program. But what does that mean for our overall AppSec program? That just means we fix issues in different products. Well, this kind of comes back to the data that I talked about earlier, right? That we're able to collect a lot of really interesting data about vulnerabilities that are submitted so we can make decisions about overall vulnerabilities that are a big issue for Riot, or we can drill that down into different product types. So we found that really two of our biggest problems were unsurprisingly cross-site scripting across the whole of Riot. We found that around about 40% of all of our vulnerabilities were cross-site scripting. You, know, you don't need to be a genius to know that that means you should start focusing on cross-site scripting, right? But overall, we found with this data that JavaScript and secure JavaScript in general was something that people were struggling with, that our engineers were struggling with, and that drove some of our automation decisions that I'm gonna talk about um, very shortly. So what I wanted to say on this, right, is if you go down the route of launching a bug bounty program, is like researchers are gonna find vulnerabilities. You might think you have the most secure products in the world. Researchers are gonna find stuff, right? These are people who are really, really good at breaking things. So if you market your program correctly and you have interesting products, you're gonna have no problems attracting people to come and break your stuff. But I think where the difference comes in is how you treat those researchers and how you deal with the things they submit to you. If you see them as like some kind of inconvenience, a problem for you to deal with, you won't get the most out of your researchers and you won't get the most out of your bug bounty program. So you should really look at every submission that comes into your bug bounty program as a learning opportunity or maybe something that you then need to feed into your roadmap, right? Because if you take those submissions and you start to do smart analysis of them, then you can spot trends, right? You can tailor your AppSec awareness training, your AppSec roadmap items to focus on the problems that your engineers are having, right? And that's super important. It's not taking something like the AppSec list that's in the PCI requirements. It's focusing on what your engineers are having problems with. The other thing that I would say is actually make sure that your product teams and engineers know you're gonna do this. Because if you only speak to them once a year when you give them PCI training, and then out of nowhere you come along with this kind of avalanche of security vulnerabilities, you're not gonna build those good relationships with those engineering teams, right? So, automation, probably the bit that maybe some of you are more interested in. So I'm not gonna talk about everything we've done for automation at Riot, because that, that would be a long time. But I am around the rest of the day if people wanna talk about it. What I'm gonna talk about here is some specific things we have built and implemented to make security engineers and software engineers' lives easier when it comes to building those secure experiences for our players. And I guess, you know, I don't really need to tell people here why automation is important, right? And Dan at the back there talked on this, uh, so he touched on this in his talk earlier around that. We all want more automation, right? That goes without saying, but um, we won't just do automation for the sake of it. We look at the issues our engineers have, and then we look at which of those issues we can add good automation in place for. What can we reliably automate? And so when we think about reliably automated, right, it means it shouldn't be noisy. There shouldn't be an overwhelming amount of false positives that people have to dig through to find the one security problem, right? So we try and make sure that we focus on things that we think can be low noise and high value to our teams. And so at a high level, we decided to focus on two areas, I guess. One was cross-site scripting. Not necessarily, the, well, the thing I'm gonna talk about in this talk is not necessarily about prevention of it. It's about saving security engineers time when these things are submitted to our bug bounty program and then insecure JavaScript overall, which was largely uh, cross-site scripting, but there were other issues in there for sure. So has anyone here ever run a bug bounty program? Okay, cool. So I think you'll probably agree that maybe the biggest resource cost for you as a business is the validation of submissions to the bug bounty program. Because right? you need to take what a researcher has submitted, you need to check whether it's something that's even in scope, check whether you can reproduce it, escalate that to product teams, and so on. And now, in some cases, that might be super quick, right? If you have something like a reflected XSS issue, that's super quick to validate. Right? It might only be a few minutes. But when something takes a few minutes and it's 40% of all of your vulnerabilities, that still starts to take up a lot of time. On top of that, we have some potentially very complex bugs that are submitted that maybe are very deep in kind of game server logic or game client logic and we need game engineers involved. And those ones can take potentially days for us to verify. Now when we looked at automation, probably unsurprisingly, I was not trying to automate the verification of that type of bug. 
So I thought probably the, one of the simplest issues that we get in our program to verify is a reflected cross-site scripting issue. And so I'm not trying to say that we've solved this problem at all. We're a long way away from completely replacing the human in the verification of some of these bug bounty submissions. But I'm gonna show you a video in, in a short while that I hope at least shows you that we've made some good progress on it and something we're gonna focus a bit more on. So when it comes to verifying a reflected cross-site scripting issue, right, you don't need to be like Ken in here, right? you don't need to break out your best ninja skills. What are you gonna do? Probably click on the link, see if an alert pop-up box appears, and see if it's probably the right value in the alert pop-up box, right? There's probably not too much more to it uh, when it comes to verifying a reflected cross-site scripting issue. And so when I sat down and thought about that, I thought, well, I'm pretty certain I can write code that will do that for us instead. So that's what I did. I'm gonna show you the code for this in a second because it's really, really small. It's maybe about 40 lines of code for this initial proof of concept. And really what I was trying to do was figure out whether we could uh, remove a human from the verification of reflected cross-site scripting submissions to the program. And so initially, I decided to use Phantom and Casper.js, um, using JavaScript to do uh, browser automation, basically filling in forms, clicking buttons, those kind of things. And I'm, I'm actually pretty rubbish at JavaScript, and even I was able to put this together and have a working proof of concept. So I just wanna actually show you the code because it's like, 40 lines of code, like pretty much everything you need to see is there, sorry, I know that's a bit small, but basically all that is going to do is take the proof of concept URL you send in, so blah, 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 alert, blah, 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 right? This will go away, it will then try and open that page, um, it will see if we have an alert pop up, it's gonna check, uh, see if, we, if it's document.domain, document.cookie, see if those right kind of values are within that alert pop up box, and that's probably as much as you need to do at that point in the bug bounty process to know whether this is a valid issue or not. So real simple, but it actually slowed down the process because someone had to run this on the command line, need to log into Hacker One, copy and paste the URL on the command line, get the results and so on. But it proved to me that we were, it was at least possible to do some of this automation. So I decided I'd focus on it a little bit more and make things a bit cooler. So at Riot, we have an annual hackathon called Thunderdome, uh, where I think six or 700 people from around the world at Riot actually take part in it. So it's not just for engineers, um, but the majority of the participants are engineers. And so what I decided to do was to try and create a better proof of concept, one that could completely remove the human uh, in that kind of verification process for reflected cross-site scripting. So for me, mainly because my JavaScript sucks, as I said, um, I moved to Selenium for this and used the Selenium web driver. Again, basically the same idea, but we're using Java instead to drive those browser actions. And so I'm gonna show you a short video in a second. Um, it's quite short, I think it verifies the submission in about 20 seconds, um, which is far quicker than anyone in our AppSec team could do it. And like I said, I just wanna put this caveat on it, like this is still very much a, like a research project for us, I guess, but it proved to us that it could work. So what you'll see is rather than needing a human, what this tool will do now is it'll log into HackerOne, it'll find a valid XSS submission, use one of the proof of concept URLs that a researcher provided, sees, yep, alert pop-up box, the right kind of value is in there, it'll go back to the ticket in HackerOne and add a comment saying, yep, this looks like a valid XSS submission, um, which is what we wanted from it. And now again, right, there's work for us to do in this area, but we're pretty confident that we can expand this out a little bit further. Right? There are those real complex bugs where you don't need humans. So where you do need humans, I should say. But imagine if there are issues where it's like there's one of those security headers missing. If you care about that, that's actually super easy to automate as well. Right? So we have work to do in this area, but it can help us significantly level up what we're doing with AppSec Riot. So then what I wanted to focus on was secure JavaScript automation, right? And this comes back to that idea earlier of, of fighting together, right? And not with each other. Because when I went to LA and I met with one of our software engineers, and I asked him that question around what is it that they wish they had from us. He said, I went to your uh, secure coding website, I saw the JavaScript page, and it was all very good. But what would be far more valuable for us is if you took everything that's on that page and wrote rules for ESLint, which they use for static analysis for JavaScript. Now me being pretty excited about that, I was like, yeah, I can do that. Turns out even when the static analysis tool is written 
to allow you to write rules and plugins fairly easily, it's still static analysis, right? So it's, it's still not the easiest uh, task in the world, but you know, that was one of our engineering teams or individual engineer giving us a fantastic idea, right? This was something that we could build as an AppSec team that would help not just that engineer and that product team, but many product teams around the world at Riot. So what I did is I went away and I took the things that we had on our secure JavaScript page, and you'll probably recognize some of those similar stuff to what you see on the OS website about insecure JavaScript. And so we created ESLint rules for each one of those. Right? And so now, individual teams may or may not use these rules, and I'm gonna come back to that in a second, but for the teams that do use them, they get this basic set of JavaScript security checks done every day. Now what we've started to work on is creating rule sets for JavaScript frameworks. So for those of you who know the Node Security Project, they recently published um, a set of node security rules for ESLint. Saves me doing some work there. But then there are other JavaScript frameworks that need that kind of attention. And we use a lot of different ones at Riot. So we're gonna focus on adding more rules to that ESLint rule set. So what I wanted to show here, sorry, is a very short video of us actually creating a Burp Suite plugin as well. Because I wanted um, our engineers, security engineers, to also have access to these rules. Now, if you're doing you know, a full white box security test and you have the source code, where well, you can just run these for yourself, right? But if you don't have the code and you see that JavaScript is being returned uh, by using Burp Suite, well, now our engineers can use this plugin and still get the same benefit, right? So they right click a, re a response that has JavaScript in it. It'll then run these ESLint rules over that JavaScript. And then within Burp, it'll tell you about any issues it found in that code. Again, it's taking those rules and trying to make them more useful to more people. And so that's what really inspired the next thing that I worked on. Because I wanted to kind of be like Leona here, come charging in with my, my shield and protect as many people as I could. Now for different reasons, teams might not use those ES, ESLint rules, right? They might not like ESLint, they might use something else. They might have a very specific way of building things and they don't want to add things into that process. That's okay. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try and do something with them, right? So we use GitHub internally, and we have uh, over 12,000 repositories in GitHub. Um, and so I thought, well, why don't we use the GitHub API and its ESLint rules to make sure that every single piece of JavaScript that changes in Riot around the world every day gets this basic set of security checks done against it. So what this does is it looks for any repositories that have changes or been created within the past 24 hours. It'll look over the, the commits for that project if it finds JavaScript changes, it'll clone it, it'll run these ESNet security rules over them and then create a report for the AppSec team telling us about any issues it's found. And this, within a week of us putting this live, it stopped us shipping vulnerabilities uh, to live, which is fantastic. Um, the next step for us is really to add kind of more visualization and tracking and workflow, the boring stuff, I guess, around this tool. But we're still continuing to push on and develop this tool further which led us to build our first Slack bot. So what this Slack bot does is it, it still uses that GitHub security scanner that I talked about before, but it, it tries to do things in a slightly different way. So what this does is it looks for repositories which were created in the past 24 hours. Right? So we want to find new products that are being developed. And then if we can identify the tech that is being used, so in this case, Node.js, we then reach out to the, the, the project author and tell them, hey, we saw you were building this thing, looks like Node.js, here's a few resources that we recommend you check out. Um, and if you wanna speak to us um, about any additional security checks and so on going forward, here's how you contact us. Right, so this is not supposed to be a spammy, big, long, massive list of security requirements, it's just like, hey, we saw you were building this thing, here's some things that can help you build that securely. Now we've started to expand on this to try and offer more services to product teams uh, when they get this uh, message from a bot. So still staying on Node for a second, I mentioned the Node security project before, right? They have this thing which allows you to check for insecure NPMs, right? It'll take your package.json, it'll use their service and tell you if you have any uh, NPMs that have vulnerabilities in them. There are obviously things like OS dependency checker and so on as well, That's so we are looking at other things. But the, what we want to do is with this initial message, help engineers from day one of their new project be more secure. So now what we're able to do is reach out to them with this kind of message and also say, hey look, we ran this check, it looks like you're using two NPMs here that have vulnerabilities in them, here's where you can go to find out more. And now, uh, Slack introduced these kind of buttons into messages, I think last week, 
or very recently, where you don't have to add conversation functionality to basically get conversations. So what we want to add to this now is as we go and add more things like the NPM check for engineers, we want to have buttons in those messages that give them the ability with one click of a button to opt into more of these security assessments on an automated basis. So we're not going along to them and saying, hey, you should add this into the, your build process, right? We're, we're not even doing that. We're going to take care of that for them if they click one button in Slack to ask us to do it. Um, so that's something we're working on now. But again, it's really about making sure they know we're there to support them and that they have things that enable them to ship things in a secure way, right? So in this case, we're not even add, asking them to add things to their, their build process or anything like that. We're going to take care of that for them if they click one button. So one of the things that we've also started to look at, and this is why I'm very interested in watching your talk, Marissa, because we're going to talk about T-shirts that we made uh, here because we have awesome artists, right? All of the art that you've seen in this presentation were created by game artists at Riot. Now, what that allows us to do is go to them and have some pretty awesome t-shirts, and not just t-shirts, but even these cards and other things created that are custom, right? So what we had is we thought about this thing um, in a bug bounty context, but also in our security engineering context of this concept of, in bug bounty land at least, more than money rewards. But then in, internally, it's like, what can we do to make sure security champions feel appreciated? And so the image you see on the screen here is, is like the equivalent of that in our game. Right? This is something that you could only get. It's a special skin you could only get if you reached a certain level of performance in the game last year. You can't go and buy this. And so what we did is we worked with some of our artists and we took one of the kind of cuddly, cute champions in the game that everyone seems to like, and we created a special t-shirt for security champions. And so this isn't just for AppSec. We give these out globally to anyone who really stands out, who does something that amazes us. And it's quite a high bar to get it, and I think we've probably only given out about 50 or 60 of these globally. But when you get one of those t-shirts, someone should ask you, hey, where did you get that cool t-shirt from? Because it's Riot art, it's Riot IP, but people have never seen it before, or it's very rare. They know they can't go and buy it, so they want to know how someone get, gets it. And it was quite interesting, because we gave one out a few months ago to someone, and he was like, yeah, ever since I saw you give one of those to someone else on my team, I really wanted one of those t-shirts. And so he didn't necessarily uh, go out of his way to do things to earn it, he just did the things that he thought was right, and that got him a t-shirt, right? So we don't... We don't tell people uh, very widely that we give these things out. It should always be a surprise to them when they get them. And they should always feel happy about it. What we've also tried to do on top of that is some of the things I talked about before around conference tickets for AppSec conferences for security champions. Bring them along with you. Let them learn with you and take those lessons back to their product teams. And then one of the other things that we started to do recently is we host like security meetups where we bring people to Riot and we do security talks and so on. We did one earlier this year where one of our security champions did an amazing presentation on how him and his team have replaced the authentication and authorization system for tens of millions of players around the world. Off the back of that, because as a security team, we were so impressed by it, we flew him over to Dublin, right? So he got to come and visit another part of the world to give that presentation to other people in a different part of the world, right? So again, make sure that those security engineers actually do feel special. Don't just tell them that they are, right? Give them things and show them that what they're doing is different and you appreciate it. And so lastly, like winning at AppSec, you know, it's a battle at a time, right? This is our world championship trophy. And just like in the game, right, you can't get that trophy by winning one game. You can't build an amazing AppSec program by just shipping one secure product. So if you're starting out new, um, don't take the Microsoft SDL and try and force that on everyone. Try and figure out what's worked in your company, in your culture, take those little bits and try and level up your security program with the things that are going to work in your organization. Um, that's it for my talk. So like, thanks, everyone, for coming along. I hope you've all gotten a little something out of it. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. I'm around for the rest of the day as well.
excellent question. Just to, I guess, to quickly rephrase that. Is there anything that people do in the finance industry from a security uh, point of view that we can bring into the games industry? Definitely so. I think um, sometimes the finance industry do get security right, but it's like really overbearing and kind of top-down driven. What we have to do in the games industry is take those things but figure out how we apply them differently, if that makes sense. So most of our security team, certainly in Dublin, come from financial services. So yeah, there's definitely things that can be brought over, but it's more about how you implement and how you uh, kind of market them, I guess, for want of a better description. I think some bits of it would. Um, some of the things that I talk about here, I did do in financial services. I think it probably depends on the type of company you work for in finance. Uh, for me, it was very much a smaller, less than 200 people wanting to disrupt banks and so on. So some of these ideas were definitely easier to implement there. Um, yeah, I think both can learn from each other, but it all comes down to that corporate culture, and sometimes you're not going to get away with some of the things you can't. Like some of the things we got away with in finance of how we did messaging, we'd just be shut down at Riot if we tried to do it. And vice versa, really. We probably wouldn't be taken seriously in some financial organizations in terms of how we present our messaging uh, in a games company. So how do we get people interested in security in the first place? Uh, two ways. So every single person who joins Riot goes through D-Noob training. And part of that is a security presentation. It's not a boring security presentation. It's more around like, hey, here's all the times we screwed up in the past and what you can do to avoid that. And then every engineer goes through an engineering onboarding program uh, in which our director of security presents and also talks about, hey, here's how we messed up in the past. And here's what you can do as an individual engineer to avoid doing that. Um, and then you're relying on the culture of being player focused and trying to do awesome things for players, uh, kind of helping us enforce that. But it's kind of on us to help them understand the security uh, in that context, right? One more question. I wouldn't say we've measured it, but we've, oh sorry, I'll repeat the question. Have we measured um, the impact of a security champion? Of like what positive they bring? Um, I wouldn't say we've measured it as such. We have a lot of stories we can tell about when we've seen that being successful. Um, I think if we look at the product teams who have the best security champions, they definitely have less security vulnerabilities over time. They also have significantly quicker fix times for security vulnerabilities that they do have. Um, so outside of that, I wouldn't say we've spent too much time measuring it, um, but we have a lot of stories that kind of back up it being successful for us. Okay, thank you very much everyone.